Here we introduce a new vocabulary word, and that is linear momentum. In the physics definition, it is very simple. All it is is the product of an object's mass and its linear velocity. Oftentimes, we just talk about momentum, but linear momentum serves to differentiate uh, mo linear momentum from angular momentum, which we'll talk about in Chapter 11. But for now, linear momentum, like I said, is just the product of mass and velocity. Velocity, of course, is a vector. Mass is a scalar. So our direction of our momentum vector will always be in the same direction as the velocity vector. And the units of mass is kilograms. The units of velocity is meters per second. So the units of momentum then is kilogram meters per second. There is no other name for it. Why the letter P for linear momentum? Well, Newton's second law was originally uh, spoken of in terms of a change in momentum being caused by a force. Today we say, you know, F equals MA, a force causes an acceleration. But originally, a force caused a change in momentum. And at that time, uh, the time when Newton published his work Principia, there was a word impetus, and that was the quality of an object that was moved to be moving independent of an observed force. So from the word impetus, we get the letter P for momentum. Which has more momentum? A 40,000 kilogram truck moving at 2.2 miles per hour or a 2,000 kilogram SUV moving at 45 miles per hour? The answer is they have the same momentum. Their mass times their velocity in meters per second, I've done the conversion here and here, shows me that they both have 40,000 kilogram meters per second worth of momentum. So heavy things and light things can have the same momentum because velocity is also a factor. A very large ship sitting still in the water has no momentum, whereas a very small object, a bullet, moving at a very high velocity has a lot of momentum. So as I mentioned a little while ago, Newton originally expressed his second law in terms of momentum. He said that net force is equal to the time rate of change of momentum. And we can come to the more familiar F equals MA form of the equation if we replace P with MV. And uh, we see that M is a constant, so it moves over here. And the derivative of velocity with respect to time is acceleration. And we get our more familiar form of Newton's second law, F equals MA. Now, in the book, you'll notice they use the small case P and a large case P. And the difference is a small case P is used when we're talking about a single particle, and a large case P is used when we're talking about a collection of particles. So this large case P, then, is the momentum of a system of particles. And that is defined to be the sum of all the individual momenta together. So uh, the individual me momenta of every particle that makes up the system of particles. So P1 plus P2 plus P3, etc., all the way out to N particles. And I'll replace uh, the momentum of particle one with the mass of particle one times the velocity of particle one. And the momentum of particle two with the mass of particle two times the velocity of particle two, and so on. And we see this expression here, uh, if you remember from the lesson on section 9.3, I can show it to you. Here it is. We showed that M1, V1 plus M2, V2 plus dot, dot, dot out to M and Vn is equal to the total mass of the system times the velocity of the center of mass of the system. So I'm going to replace all of this right here with the total mass times the velocity of the center of mass. So what that shows me is that the total momentum for the system of particles is equal to the mass of the system, or the total mass of all the particles, times the velocity of the center of mass of the system. And if I take the time derivative of this equation, 
we know that the time derivative of velocity is acceleration. And once again, from the lesson from section 9.3, we showed that total mass times acceleration of the center of mass is equal to the net force. So I can replace this total mass times the acceleration of the center of mass with net force, and we come up with Newton's second law applied to a system of particles that says the net force acting on a system of particles is equal to the time rate of change of its momentum. The momentum of any particle-like body cannot change unless a net external force changes it. For example, we could push on a body, in this case a little shopping cart, to change its momentum. More dramatically, we could arrange for the body to collide with a baseball bat. In such a collision or crash, the external force on the body is brief, has large magnitude, and suddenly changes the body's momentum. Let's consider a simple collision between a ball and a bat. The collision is brief and the ball experiences a force that is great enough to slow it, stop it, or even reverse its motion. The ball experiences a force as a function of time that varies during the collision and changes the linear momentum of the ball. Let's look at this in closer detail. Let's look at a collision between a baseball and a bat. Here we'll show it in slow motion first. There you saw the ball hit the bat. Let's go watch it again, and I'll just step through it frame by frame. You can see as the ball begins to be hit by the bat, <clears throat> the ball begins to compress and squish. And then as it leaves the bat, it returns to its regular shape. So the force acting on the ball throughout that time is not a constant force. It is changing. And in fact, Let's look at it uh, with the graph of force and time set next to it. So up here, we'll watch the video of the ball hitting the bat. Here will be the force on the ball from the bat as time goes on. Okay, let's look at that again, and we'll step through it frame by frame. Here we go. So before the ball hits the bat, of course, the force acting on the ball is zero. And as the ball first makes contact with the bat, that's when we see the force on the ball is beginning to increase. And as the ball deforms more and more, the force on the ball increases until at the maximum deformity of the ball, we see a maximum force exerted on the ball by the bat. And then as the ball begins to leave the bat, and the deformity of the ball becomes less, the force acting on the ball decreases until, of course, it leaves the bat altogether, and that's when the force on the ball returns to zero. So let's look at Newton's second law in its original form that says force is equal to the, to the time rate of change of momentum. Let's rearrange the dt to the other side of the equation, and let's integrate both sides. The integral of dp is p, and when we plug in our limits of integration, we see we get p final minus p initial, and that is the definition of impulse, the change in momentum, p final minus p initial. And we're going to use the letter j to represent impulse. So here we have it. Impulse J, which is change in momentum, and we can write it different ways. We can say delta P, we can say J, or we can say P final minus P initial. Those all mean the same thing. A change in momentum is equal to the integral of force with respect to time. Now, if we have an equation that describes our force as a function of time, we can simply integrate that, plug in our limits of integration, and get a numerical answer for our impulse. But more often, we do not have an equation for the uh, force, but we have the graph. So the purple graph here is what we were able to uh, generate measuring the baseball hitting the bat. And the area under the curve, right? This is what this means. The area under the force as a function of time curve uh, is the impulse. 
So the area under the curve is the impulse. We could integrate it if we had an equation for that purple curve, or we could just take the area under the graph. Now, oftentimes, it's very easy to measure the impulse. We just measure its momentum before the collision, and we measure the momentum after the collision, and we take the difference, and that's the impulse, so that's not hard to measure. The time of the collision is not extremely difficult to measure. To get these values of force may be very difficult to measure. So since this is easy to measure and this is easy to measure, we can divide J by delta T and come up with a value for the average force. So it's common to see uh, an impulse caused by an average force, and that's the blue graph shown here. And what the blue and the purple graph have in common is that they both are collisions happening over the same amount of time, and they both have the same area under the curve, so they both have the same change in momentum. But what is different is the average force, which is this value here, is quite different than the maximum force. So if this was a collision of a car in an auto accident, you are not interested in what is the average force because the maximum force is what is going to do damage and what could uh, injure you in a car crash. So sometimes it's nice to know the average force. Other times uh, it's more important to know what is the maximum force. So let's look at an example. Uh, here is a car traveling, traveling at 55 miles per hour or 25 meters per second. Its mass is 1,000 kilograms, and it puts on its brakes, and it comes to a stop. So its final velocity is zero, so its final momentum is zero. So its uh, change in momentum, or its impulse, is the final momentum minus the initial momentum, a change of negative 25,000 kilogram meters per second. Now let's take that same situation, a 1,000 kilogram car traveling at 55 miles per hour, and let's smash it into a wall. The end result is the same. The final velocity is zero. The final momentum is zero. So the zero minus 25,000 is still a change in momentum of negative 25,000 kilogram meters per second. Both instances have the same impulse. Now you say to yourself, these situations are very different. And that is true. They are very different. In this one, you walk away to drive another day. Here, you're on your way to the hospital in the ambulance. But still, the definition of impulse is the change in momentum, and both of these situations have the same impulse. Let's look at graphs of force as a function of time. Here you see the force is not very large, but it's over a long period of time, and the area under the curve is equal to the impulse. When you smash into the wall, the duration of the collision is very short now, but the maximum force is very large. And but the areas under the areas under the curves are the same. The impulses are the same. Here you live to walk again. Here you possibly are severely injured. They have the same impulse. But what is different is the maximum force and the time of the collision. To show that in a simpler way, let's look at our equation for uh, Newton's second law in its original form that said force is equal to the time rate of change of momentum, but that's the same as the change in momentum over the change in time. So let's cross multiply delta t to the other side. And let's rewrite change in momentum as final momentum minus initial momentum. The mass is not changing, so we can factor that out, and we can just call this mass times change in velocity. So we see here that uh, a change in momentum, if we assume the change in the momentum for any situation is a given, this right side of the equation will stay constant. But what can be different in uh, different situations is the amount of force and the, um, time and the time interval over which that force acts. So we can have a very short time 
with a large force can produce the same result as a much smaller force over a longer period of time. This is uh, quite evident with the use of airbags. If you think about a stuntman jumping off a building, if he lands in an airbag, the time over which he slows down is much larger than if he were to just land on the pavement. And so the force is much less, and he survives the fall. If he lands on the pavement, delta T is very small, F is very big, and that large force would injure or kill the stuntman. What's the matter, John? I love it. I don't know, Bill. Hey, uh, we're gonna go higher after this is a warm up. Still rolling, got in the chair on the back, got in the chair on the back, got in the chair on the back. Now, boy, I got some of the best still rolling. Still, hey, 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 hey,